This is the seventh in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we're going to think about factoring polynomials. First, let's think about integers uh, mod prime. So as a proposition, we we'll take uh, with coefficients integers modulo some prime. Of course, it's the same prime for all of the coefficients. Um, if uh, some product vanishes, then um, a product of polynomials, of course these are polynomials, um, then um, either of the factors, one of the factors must, be, must vanish, either b of x is 0 or c of x is 0. And the proof is uh, very straightforward. Um, we just look at the coefficient of the uh, highest power and again, these are one variable polynomials, I should perhaps say. Um, the coefficient of the highest power in um, b of x, c of x is the product of the coefficients uh, in the highest highest power terms in b of x and c of x. But then we know that a product can't be 0 without one of the factors being 0. It implies one factor is 0. And that doesn't make any sense because um, these the highest term by definition is the highest non-zero term. Uh, so that's a contradiction. Next, let's think about integer coefficients. Um, uh, here's Gauss's lemma, so lemma, called Gauss's lemma. Um, if we have a polynomial, so uh, any polynomial, again, in one variable with integer coefficients in one variable. Factors over rational numbers just when it factors over integers. The idea of the proof is very simple, just clearing denominators. Um, but let's give some more details than that. Um, so we imagine that we have a polynomial. It has integer coefficients. But we've split it somehow. We've, we've expressed it somehow as a factor where these guys both have rational coefficients. But now what we could do is simply to take the denominators here of all the coefficients and find a least common denominator. Um, so we'll let d be some least common multiple of the, of the coefficients of, um, uh, of denominators. Now, um, using may maybe the same symbols b of x and c of x to mean something different, um, if I take these guys and multiply by a large enough integer to knock off all the all the denominators here and turn them all into integers, I can now make write b of x and c of x for new polynomials that now have integer coefficients. They're not the same as the old b of x and c of x. They're uh, a factorization into integer coefficients. Um, how did I do that? Well, I took whatever I had here and then found that I had, if I had a third in the, uh, three in the denominator, I need to multiply both sides by a three and so on and so forth. So that's what I've done here, making this d, which is an integer here. So now what I want to do is to write d as a product of primes. Say d is d1, d2, da, da, da. dn is a product of primes. We can allow the same prime to occur more than once. So this could be 2 times 2 times 2 times da 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 da. Um, that'd be fine too. It doesn't, uh, have, they don't have to be different primes. Let's just take one of them. 
and quotient both sides of this of this expression, uh, quotient both sides by uh, d1. In other words, take mod both sides mod d1. Now this becomes zero when we mod out by the d by the d1 because it's got d1 in here. D is a product of these primes. D1 is the first one. So when you mod out by the d1s, you um, I shouldn't say quotient. Maybe I should say mod out by d1. Um, you get uh, zero here, but here you get two polynomials, which I'll just call b bar of x and c bar of x, which is the same as b and c, but with all the coefficients now uh, quotiented out, they're all modded out by all the d1s. But now we're working modulo a prime, and we said we'd work with coefficients mod a prime. If a product is zero, one of the factors is zero. So b bar of x is zero, or c bar of x is zero. And we can always assume it, whichever one it is, we can re relabel which is b and which is c, so we can always assume it's this one. That's zero. What does that mean? That means when we modded out all the all the copies of d1 from all the coefficients, all the coefficients died. So in other words, that means that d1 divides all all coefficients of b of x or of c of x in this case. But if it divides all those coefficients, we can write down our equation: d p of x is b of x c of x, and we can divide a d1 off of here, and we can also divide a d1 off of here, and so we reduce to a smaller d, and we apply induction until we get rid of all of d. We want to have a notion of irreducible over integer coefficients, which is going to be a little bit different from the notion of irreducible we've already used. Um, so uh, an integer coefficient polynomial is um, is said to be irreducible if um, it does not split split into a product of integer um, coefficient polynomials, so a product over the integers, um, unless uh, b of x is uh, plus or minus one constant or c of x is plus or minus one constant. So that's a bit different from what we did with, with, with irreducibility over, say, the rational numbers, where we just didn't want us to split into lower degree factors. Here we're allowing the possibility one of these factors might be an integer, a constant integer. As long as it's not plus or minus 1, then that's actually uh, considered a serious factorization and it's reducible. So as an example, we could look at um, uh, 2x cubed minus 4x plus 2, you can see there's a 2 in every factor, or in every every uh, 2 factor in every coefficient. So you could certainly factor out the 2's as one of the factors. Then we are left with a factoring x minus 1 and x squared plus x minus 1. So that's a factorization into irreducibles. I won't prove that they're irreducible. These two are fairly obvious. You'd have to think a bit about why that would be irreducible, but we won't worry about it. Um, it is irreducible. And then another factorization to irreducibles would be this one. Um, you could slip the signs of the first two and then leave the third factor exactly the same. And that would also be a factorization into irreducibles. And another would be, we could take this sign here to be, um, uh, we could take a minus sign in this one instead. And so on, there might be others, right? So at least those are three. Those are three different factorizations. I didn't say those are the only factorizations, but those are three factorizations, di which are different factorizations of the same thing. So we don't get unique factorization anymore. So an easy corollary of our previous result uh, is that we can relate integer uh, factorization and um, rational factorization if um, p of x is a polynomial it has co-prime integer coefficients, then um, p of x is irreducible over rational numbers if and only if it's irreducible over integers. And the proof is that um, by Gauss lemma, um, p of x say the factors over the rationals uh, exactly when it over the re over the integers um, exactly when it factors the integers 
but then uh, constant, if a factor was constant, um, it would uh, have to be plus or minus 1 because any other integer constant would then factoring over the integers would have to go into all the coefficients of p of x. And that's the proof. Here's a simple example. Um, we've actually seen that x cubed minus 3x minus 1 is irreducible over the rationals. And that's just because it didn't have a rational root. Um, and it clearly has co-prime coefficients. Its coefficients are co-prime integers, 1, minus 3, minus 1. And uh, so it's irreducible over the integers. So we'd really like to have a unique factorization. We saw it wasn't unique, though. But we can say that every non-zero uh, polynomial over the integers has um, as a factorization into reducibles. And it's in fact unique up to reordering and uh, possibly multiplying factors by plus or minus 1, which is what we did. So to prove this, we'll first ask about uh, the existence of the factorization. Um, and then we'll worry about the uniqueness. Um, so let's let uh, d be the greatest common divisor of the coefficients of some polynomial p of x. And then, of course, we can write p of x as d times p of x. It divides into all of them, so we divide it into all of them and write it like this, where p of x has co-prime coefficients. Co-prime, again, integer coefficients. And then, of course, this d is an integer, so it factors into primes. And so it's enough to prove it for enough to prove um, to prove the existence of our factorization for some p of x. So we can assume that p of x has co-prime coefficients. We then um, can uh, can uh, factor um, this p of x over to rationals, and we know that that has a unique factorization up to the scaling and reorderings. Um, and so, by Gauss' lemma, um, by Gauss's lemma, we can then um, factor over the integers. Integers, but this factorization was uh, there was its factorization into irreducibles. This factorization we don't know is into irreducibles, so to check that these are still irreducible. But that's not difficult. In fact, um, what we can see is that uh, the, we use the fact that these uh, coefficients are co-prime. So there's no common factor in the coefficients, and therefore there can't be a, 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 any any. Um, common factor in the coefficients over the various reduce over the various factors implies the same for each factor now for each factor because we've factorized this thing into a product of integer polynomials if one of those polynomials had a, a factor of 7 in every coefficient so would the, the the product all put together And therefore, these guys are all irreducible. We have now found irreducible integer factors. Now we want to ask, what about the, their uniqueness? We said this wasn't a model that existed, but that it was unique. Um, so what we have to do is to think about all these different factorizations. Now, what we know is that um, factorization over rationals is unique. up to order and, and order and scaling. So that must be happening here too. If we had two factorizations into irreducibles, um, uh, then our factors, um, so our factors are irreducible integer coefficient polynomials, um, and they agree up to um, 
ordering and then once we've ordered them right they agree up to um, rational scaling. So if we have two such factors let's suppose you have a, a factor in your factorization capital P of X um, this is a factor and a corresponding factor we could said we could we could make them agree up to our rational scaling once we pick the right ordering so let's do the right ordering and then we've got these up to a factor in the other factorization other factorization so we've got to figure out then how to relate these but we know that they must be oh, oh the rationals this is unique there's only one way to do it so these have to agree up to a scale factor so q of x has to be some scale factor, some rational scale factor times p of x, where a and b are then integers, and obviously non-zero, so that each factor can correspond to the other. Otherwise, we get a zero factor; the whole thing's just zero. Um, then we can rationalize the denominators in the obvious way. Just uh, put the b uh, over on the, on the other side. Um, uh, then we can take uh, the fact that these have uh, co-prime coefficients. They're irreducible, so they have co-prime. Uh, they're irreducible, so the integers, so they have co-prime coefficients. And so we take GCD of both sides of these coefficients and these coefficients, and we get B equals plus or minus A because the um, the GCD is going to turn out to be either B or minus B, either A or minus A, because all of these things are co-prime. But then that means that. Uh, of course, that uh, q is uh, q of x is plus or minus p of x, and that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted the factors to be defined up to a ma up to a sign. The next problem is to figure out when we've hit the end of the factorizations. How can we see that we're done factoring? So we know that there is some way to factor in principle, um, but what we would like is a test, which we'll call Eisenstein's criterion, that tells us when we're done. Um, uh, so we want to check that there are no more factors, and there isn't a way to factor any any more factors into a given polynomial. This criterion doesn't always work. In fact, it typically for most polynomials somehow roughly doesn't work. But it does work for a lot of examples. A lot of them that show up uh, in in practice, uh, it works for. So this is Eisenstein's criterion. Um, yeah, suppose we have an integer coefficient polynomial, integer polynomial q of x, and has some coefficients a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a naught. And um, then suppose there is an suppose there is a prime. There's a prime, let's say p, prime integer, a p so that the first uh, constraint is that p does not divide the highest term, the highest coefficient, uh, coefficient. so that's the a n, this one here, and uh, the second condition is that p divides all the others all the others, all the other coefficients. And finally, that p squared, oops, that p squared uh, does not divide the lowest coefficient. So p has to not divide the highest, p squared not divide the lowest, and p divides all the others in the middle as well as dividing the a, the a zero. Then we want to conclude then um, q of x is irreducible over the rational numbers. Note that it was an integer coefficient polynomial, but the result here is that it's rationally irreducible. Okay, so let's see if we can prove this. Um, so uh, the proof is uh, is actually surprisingly elementary. Um, uh, well, by Gauss lemma, we know that if q of x factors over the rationals, then it also factors over the integers. Um, so we can assume that. And so we'll write out the fact a factorization. And um, so we write out this Q of X in terms of all of its 
uh, coefficients here. And then we imagine that it's somehow expressible as a product of some polynomial b all the way to coefficient b naught times some polynomial c, c s x to the s plus c s minus 1 x to the s minus 1 dot 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 plus plus c naught. So we factor it, measure it's factored, and we can imagine that these are, of course, integers. So let's actually write out what that looks like. If you expand it out, the lowest order term uh, of the product comes from the product of the lowest order terms. It's simply a naught has to be b naught, c naught. a1, the linear term in the product, has to come from a uh, constant coefficient times a linear, or from a linear times a constant. And similarly, a2 has to come from b naught c2 plus b1 c1 plus b2 c naught, and so on and so forth. So we get all these terms that look something like this. Until we get to the very highest term, and the very highest term can only be the product of the various highest terms, so a n has to be b r c s. Now we go back and look at our conditions, and we said that, that this prime has to divide all of these except this one. So it has to go into these. But if it goes into a naught, it has to go into one of these. And um, so uh, p squared, or sorry, p divides uh, a naught. So it divides um, b naught or c naught. But we said p squared did not divide a naught. So, um, so it can't divide both, not both. So p divides b naught or c naught, but not both, because it divided both, then p squared would divide a naught, which is not one of our conditions that that doesn't happen. And uh, let's say uh, p divides, it doesn't matter, we can just change the labels as to which is b and which is c. So p divides b naught. Okay, so p divides b naught, um, but not uh, not c naught. So p divides b naught, but not c naught. So it divides in here, but not there. Now, um, when we look at this guy, it divides in here, not there. But um, so so then, um, it, but it divided into a1, and it divides into b naught, so it has to divide into the product. And so we end up with is um, p divides um, a1, which implies that it divides um, b naught c1 plus b1 c naught. But it, we already know that it divides b naught, so that means that it divides b1 c naught. But we know that it's uh, it doesn't divide into c naught and it's prime, so they're relative, they're co-prime, and so it divides into b1. And by the same trick applied over and over again, all the way down the list, you find you keep going and you keep finding that every term uh, p divided well divided into b naught, and now it divides into b1, and it divides into b2, and so on and so forth. If you put a plug in here, you'll find it divides into b2, and so on and so forth. And so an induction step. Uh, which I won't write out explicitly, shows that uh, p divides all, all coefficients of, um, of the b of x factor, the factor with all the b's in it, um, the factor with all the b's in it, sorry, um, here they are, uh, these ones. So that's divide all of that. Um, but if it divides all of that, it has to then divide in here. Um, divides um, a n, the highest term. And that's a contradiction to our assumptions because we assumed it doesn't divide the highest term. So let's see what are some examples of simple, uh, simple examples of polynomials that we can uh, apply this to. Let's try x to the ninth plus 14x plus 7. Note the ninth power makes this quite high. Uh, uh, so figuring out factorizations for very high degree polynomials is, is, is often very difficult. But in this case, we don't really have to. We'll take a prime p to be 7. And you can see there's a 7 in each of these. It has to be everywhere except in the highest term. And it is. So it's in every term but the highest. Um, so it's in all coefficients but the highest. And then we have to make sure that p squared, which is um, 7 times 7 squared is 49, is not uh, dividing. Uh, the lowest. And so then Eisenstein applies, and so um, so this guy therefore is irreducible. 
over the rationals. It can't be factored into uh, lower degree polynomials in with rational coefficients. To give some idea of, of uh, how this uh, really uses prime numbers, we can look at a very, very simple example like um, we could look like uh, at um, x squared plus 4x plus 4. If we try to use 4 instead of, instead of in our last example, use 7, um, can we use p equals 4? It doesn't work because it, it, it would look like it's irreducible by Eisenstein, but actually it's not irreducible. It's actually um, just x plus 2 squared. Why doesn't it work? Because it's not prime. Or if you tried to use 2, it doesn't work because there are two 2's in here. There's supposed to be only one. There's another example where Eisenstein doesn't apply. We could look at x to the ninth plus 14x plus um, 49. And you have, again, you have 2. You can try, the only thing you can try is p equals 7 because it's the only common factor of all but the highest term. But the problem is that it's, it sits in here twice. And so Eisenstein does not apply. And it better not apply. Okay, so that, so it doesn't, okay, so Eisenstein doesn't apply. And we don't know if, if that's irreducible or not. We don't know. Uh, Eisenstein doesn't tell us whether that's irreducible or not. Uh, a, a more abstract example, if we take d to be greater than zero integer, and we look at x to the d minus p, sorry, x to the d minus p um, as a polynomial, um, what we're really looking for, in other words, is the solution should be x would be uh, d th root of p. And um, what we're finding is that this guy is, um, has, um, this uh, uh, Eisenstein applies, we would take p is just p, um, it divides once in here, and then not at all in the highest term. So it does apply, and this tells us that these things are never uh, rational. Um, for d, let's say, greater than, well, I should say greater than or equal to 2, let's say, um, so that we get a non-trivial result. So far we've been thinking about factorizing and looking for roots um, for uh, polynomials that are that are um, of rational or integer coefficients, and we're really looking for rational roots. Um, what about looking at a more sophisticated issue um, where instead of looking at, uh, at one variable, we'll look at two variable polynomials and we'll look at factorization over, um, oh well, over, or factorization over um, rational functions. And this is a much trickier issue. So, um, the proposition we'll prove is also called Gauss's lemma, and that might, well, maybe it should be called lemma instead of proposition, um, but it, uh, let's say lemma. So, um, but it's called Gauss's lemma because it's essentially the same result. Um, uh, what we'll do is look at p of x and y to be a polynomial now in two variables. So up till now, all of our results were about one variable polynomials, but let's look at ones that are two variable over a field could be any of our fields, and uh, suppose that we split it up into a factorization. But now these aren't supposed to be polynomials anymore. Now we're going to allow stranger objects. We're going to allow these to be um, polynomial in x, but with rational, rational function of y coefficients. So the coefficients of those polynomials are going to be rational functions in y. And uh, so if there is a factorization like this, then uh, the result of Gauss's lemma is there, uh, we, can, we can rearrange uh, the choice of this b of x and c of x to be um, polynomial in y as well, in, so in x and y. So if you allow uh, some fa factorization, but maybe you can't really, maybe you're not uh, uh, restricting yourself to working with polynomials in x and y, you're allowing yourself the freedom to, to make the coefficients of your polynomials in x be rational functions of y, so they can have denominators. But then you can somehow get rid of those denominators. And it's very similar to the Gauss lemma we had before. In fact, we can, when I say rearrange, um, the rearranging, um, is just um, just rescaling by uh, rational uh, functions of y. 
so we don't have to do any complicated rescaling or it's complicated uh, rearranging uh, just uh, rescale this one by some rational function this one by some rational function they'll both become polynomial all, all, all the same by the same at the same time and still uh, factorize p so we will recognize the the beginning of the proof is very similar um, again it's about a common denominator so if we take a common denominator we have these b of uh, denominator we have this b of xy c of xy and they have these um, awful um, the denominators that are that are polynomials in y um, so what we do is multiply them all together and get some polynomial on this side that clears out all the denominators on the other side so it's exactly the same trick that we did before um, and now these get to be polynomials in x and y so we got rid of the of the bad behavior of all the denominators by multiplying by an appropriate uh, quantity across the numerators. Again, we can factor um, this d of y into um, a product of irreducibles. These are irreducibles over our field, whatever the field is. Now let's expand out um, that b of x, y has to be a sum of terms b naught of y plus b1 of y times 1 power of x dot 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 all the way up to some uh, br of y x to the r and similarly that c of x y should be some c naught of y plus c1 of y some function of y times x dot dot dot, dot. it was polynomial in x so it's with powers being these rational functions of or y, uh, which we've now arranged to be polynomial as well. So these are polynomials, the b's and the c's, they're polynomials in y. So similarly to our previous proof, we're going to um, break this guy into irreducibles. So we, I should give them names maybe. Uh, d of y is some d1 of y, d2 of y. These are polynomials in y that are irreducible over our, over our field. Now we look at the at multiplying these things together, and we've said that um, b of x y and c of x y are now polynomials in x and y. We can expand them out, and so we get a sum of terms of a b term and times a c term, some sort of b term of y, c term of y x to the sum of the powers of the terms. Now this uh, d1, for example, we pick one of the factors d1. And we know that d1 of y divides the product because um, it divides because of our equation. Our equation up here says that uh, the, all the d's multiply together on this side, this polynomial, give b times c. So each of them divides. Um, so d1 divides b of x, y, c of x, y. And so it must divide this guy. And this is the sum of the bj's of y, ck's of y, x to the j plus k's. And this is only of y. So let's divide into each coefficient. Each coefficient uh, in x, I should say, in x. So looking just at the lowest order term, for example, we get d1 of y divides into b naught of y, c naught of y, those are polynomials. And then it also has to divide into b naught of y, c1 of y, plus b1 of y, c naught of y, and so on and so forth all the way up. So just dividing, just the first bit here, it divides into that guy. It means it must divide into one of the factors, d1 of y divides into this product. So it divides into b naught of y or c naught of y. We can assume it's this one because uh, if it's the other one, we can just change which one's b and which one's c. So now what we do is we, we look at the, the next term. So we've got d1 of y divides d1 of y divides b naught of y, but it also divides um, we said it divided b naught of y c1 of y plus b1 of y c naught of y. And um, so 
um, but said it, it already divides into this one, so it must divide into that one. And being irreducible, it means it has to divide into one of the factors. So it divides um, b1 of y or c0 of y. So we've got another term that it divides. And we keep going in this way, making more and more terms that it divides. And we know, for example, that um, if d1 of y divides some collection of b coefficients, b0 of y up to some bj of minus 1 of y, and divides c0 of y to c k minus 1 of y, then we can expand out um, if it divides. Then we know that it must divide the, um, the coefficients of the product, and we work out the coefficient, which is um, it divides um, b0 of y times c j plus k of y plus b1 of y cj plus k minus 1 of y plus da 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 um, plus b j minus 1 of y c uh, k plus 1 of y that's a bunch of b's that it divides into plus there's here's a term that we don't know whether or not divide we don't know what happens here um, bj ck of y and then we'll start on some other terms um, b j plus 1 of y c k minus 1 of y plus da -da 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 plus all the way down to b j plus k um, of y c naught of y and we've assumed that uh, we divided into all of these that's this one and this one and all the way down to this one and then um, uh, so then uh, sorry you can't see the last term um, so then uh, we've we've assumed here that d divides into a whole bunch of b's and a whole bunch of c's into some b's and some c's divides into these b's and it divides into these c's da -da 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 there so it divides into one of every factor here and one of every factor here and so it has to somehow divide into here so um, so uh, that means d one of x divides um, b j of y c k of y and it's irreducible and so it divides one or the other so b j of y or c k of y so that means every time you have it dividing a bunch of b's and c's it must divide yet another b and c b or c one or the two and so we keep going and going and going by induction until it divides all the way through either b all the b's or all the c's in that way, uh, it divides all the way into B or C. So D1 of, sorry, of Y uh, divides all the coefficients. So it divides B of X, Y all the way through, or C of X, Y all the way through. And therefore, we can divide it off from both sides of our equation. D of Y, P of X, Y is B of X, Y, C of X, Y. We can make a simpler, lower, uh, lower degree equation by taking the D1 out of here and taking it also out of one of these two. That reduces the order of the equation, and we keep going down and down and down by induction until we get a grid of D of Y entirely becomes just a constant, non-zero constant, and then we can just divide it off. Now, we'd like to have an Eisenstein criterion for being able also to stop uh, dividing things into other things uh, for these two variable um, polynomials. And of course, all this stuff generalizes to many, but I just wanted to give two variable, um, two variable uh, uh, proofs because I don't want things to become too overwhelming, uh, the complications of having lots of variables. So we'll have an Eisenstein criterion for these things. Suppose that Q of X and Y is a polynomial in two uh, variables over a field. Could be any of our fields. So we write out what it looks like um, and expand it out as um, some polynomial in y times the power of x plus polynomial in y times the next lowest power of x plus uh, dot, 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 dot plus all the way down to a polynomial in y with no x's. We can, we can always do that, of course, just by gathering up all the terms that have an x to the n in them, all the ones that have an x minus x and minus 1 in them, and so on and so forth, all that way up to these which have no x's in them. Now, suppose, it's going to be very similar to our previous treatment, suppose that P of y is an irreducible, 
uh, gain over our field. We're working over a field, so it's got to be irreducible over our field, not over the integers or anything like that. It's an irreducible polynomial, irreducible over our field, and that the following conditions satisfy p of y does not divide the highest the highest uh, term, that's the a n of y, the biggest one here, the big one here, um, and then that uh, divides all the others, all the others, all the other a's of y, and then finally that um, p of y squared does not um, divide the lowest. That's the a naught of y. Then we want to conclude that it's irreducible. Then um, q of x and y is irreducible over the field we're working over. The proof is particularly pleasant here. Um, the proof is simply that it's exactly the same as it was when we worked with integer coefficient polynomials. Uh, the reason is that um, step by step it, it all goes through perfectly. Um, after all, we just we just proved the the basic result that we needed um, to be able to imitate the the integer uh, the integer coefficient proof. So, as an example of applying this criterion, let's look at a simple example: x to the thirteenth plus x y plus y. There's a, a polynomial two variables, and we can make our p of y just be y because we have a, a single y in this term and a y in all the terms except the highest. There's the highest term, no y. Um, so there's no y in the highest term. That's the x to the thirteenth term. It has no y in it. Um, but there's uh, one y, uh, on, only one y in uh, the lowest, and then there's a y in everybody else, right? Every, everybody other than the highest term. So, so that means this is irreducible. But, but, but over, irreducible over what? Over which field? It's irreducible over any field, any of our fields. So we could interpret the coefficients as being integers mod a prime, for example, integers mod uh, 19. And that would be fine. With integers coefficients mod 19, this is irreducible. But it's also irreducible over the complex numbers, which is a bit surprising. The fundamental theorem of algebra told us that we couldn't have any one variable polynomials that were irreducible over the complex numbers. Over the complex numbers, one variable polynomial was split into linear factors. So unless they were linear, they were, they were definitely not irreducible. But now we have two variables. This is actually irreducible over the complex numbers. So what's surprising is that it's actually over simultaneously over any field. And that's an important observation, that we can relate uh, many different fields, and that we can consider sometimes the same expression as being defined over very different fields. And that can help us to relate um, uh, the understanding of these polynomials to one another, uh, to, well, to, to a polynomial for one field can be understood by how it behaves over another field sometimes. So we want to cover one more topic. We've now talked about integer polynomials and rational polynomials, and also about polynomials in two variables, and tried to understand factorization. We want to think about now about homogeneous polynomials. What's homogeneous mean? Um, we'll talk about polynomial in several variables and say the degree of a, of a monomial, a single term, is the uh, sum of its degrees in each variable. When I talk about a polynomial, I don't say that it's a several variable, then I usually just mean it's one variable. Um, but when I want to start talking about homogeneous polynomials, I really want to think about many variables. So the degree of a monomial is the sum of degrees in each variable. And um, and the degree of a polynomial, so a monomial is a single term and a, and a polynomial sum. Um, the degree of a polynomial um, is the highest degree uh, of a monomial of any monomial when it's written as a sum of distinct monomials of monomials with distinct of distinct powers. And a polynomial is homogeneous. If you can write it as uh, in such a way that all the um, all the monomials have the same degree, in other words, something like, uh, for example, we could take x to the seventh, y to the ninth, plus x to plus say two x to the sixth, and then 
I've taken one away from the x, I have to add something to the y to make up for it. So um, minus 14x to the 16. Uh, that's homogeneous because every term has degree 16. 7 plus 9 is 16. 6 plus 10 is 16. And 16 here. So it's a homogeneous polynomial. And we want to make an almost obvious um, uh, result about, prove an almost obvious result about, about uh, these things that over any field, every factor, you know, any factorization of the, let's say, factor of a homogeneous of a homogeneous yes, polynomial is itself homogeneous. Um, and the proof is actually easy. Um, it's just simply that if you took a, a factorization, let's say b of, well, we can do it in two variables and just to just to keep our our wits about us, um, we'll, we'll do it in two variables, but we won't worry about doing it in any other number of variables because the, the proof in any other number of variables will be the same. Um, so then we can simply say that the highest degree um, uh, term in the product um, is a product of highest degree terms. In other words, if you take a term, you look at the, the total degrees of all the terms and expand it out um, and take, take the part of it that has the highest possible degree, the product is the product of uh, well, the sum of products of highest degree terms. And the same for lowest. So if you try to make the lowest possible uh, term that's going to show up here and make the highest, uh, they come from lowest and highest terms. Um, and so what you get is simply that um, that uh, the, the, the result reduces down to counting that, that the lowest terms lowest would be lowest, the highest times highest, highest, but then, then those have to end up being the same. Um, and uh, the same, and that means they must have been the same to begin with. In the next lecture, we'll think about reasons why we want to have more fields than we've had so far. We need extra larger fields to work with um, to be able to, to solve some, some technical problems. And so we'll need to have a theory that enables us to, to, to describe lots of different sorts of fields, much uh, many more than, than the ones we've been working with so far.